and I am Pete Bickford, your host for this wonderful edition of Comic Base Livestream. Uh, thanks everyone for coming here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, basically all things comics, comic base, and culture related that apply to comics. Uh, but uh, importantly, uh, this time out, I want to talk a little bit about things that um, you kind of forget you know, you you know, or you know, maybe maybe you didn't know them to start with, but but it's you know things that you wish you knew when you started using the program that you would tell a younger version of yourself, because uh, we're uh, facing down that question ourselves as we uh, prepare to do, launch our next version of Comic Base, and and I want to hear your your uh, uh, opinions on that one. But let's uh, let's get into some news first, and we'll take it from there. First of all, I want to say hey to everyone out in the chat. By the way, if you haven't done so before, please like and subscribe uh, the uh, button on there on YouTube. Uh, it helps you know get the notifications out to everyone who's on the mailing list who doesn't otherwise get notified, uh, and it just helps that old algorithm, as everyone loves saying. By the way, uh, in uh, um, yeah, recognition of the great importance of uh, YouTube's commitment to truth, of you know fearless truth above all, um, oh my goodness, we love us some vaccines on this live stream. Wow, vaccines are the best ever. There's nothing bad to say about vaccines of any sort. We love us some vaccines. So hopefully that helps spread the notifications out under the new rules that were announced yesterday. Um, anyway, guys. Uh, hey, uh, Rob, uh, nice to see you. Join us, Mike. Good to see everyone. Oro, uh, hail agent to camp. Uh, and Andre, good to see everyone out there. Uh, and Ed, good to go. Competent man, hey, it's good to see the folks. I keep on hoping uh, the contingent from Australia make it in. I hope you all are doing well down there. It's just, uh, I, every once in a while I catch news coverage, I'm like, whew. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but uh, let's move on. Um, Industry news-wise, uh, uh, Windows 11 is coming next week. It'll be uh, launched on October 5th, and uh, so expect to see some rounded windows in everyone's uh, future, some better dark modes, some more bitchin'-looking icons, and then no one's really sure what else. I, actually, you know, there are a number of things, and we'll go into them uh, probably next week or the week after. Uh, I would be running the preliminary build of... Uh, Windows 11 myself right now, except that if you saw what Microsoft wants you to to agree to in order to be part of the insider program, it's like full monitoring of all your app usage, every site you visit, all whatever. It, it's crazy how intrusive the insider program's uh, release requirements are. So I was like, yeah, not on my development machine. Um, <laughs> funny thing is, I, I knew a kid across the street, you know, who was like, uh, his, his, his edgiest thing that he does all day long is play Paw Patrol, and he's like, yep, sign me up, and he was like, you know, the guy's like eight years old, and he's had Windows 11 for like six months now. Um, but anyway, the rest of this will get in about a week, and uh, I'm looking forward to it, frankly. I, I think it's going to be a good one. Uh, I, I just, I have that feeling. Um, the other thing that's going to be interesting about it is it also gives a date of death for Windows 10. So if you finally got used to everything that Windows 10 is doing, um, know that it won't be in your life all that much longer. By, by October 14th, 2025, Windows 10 will be no more. So, um, you know, enjoy it while you got it. Uh, in the meantime, Microsoft, of course, has announced a number of new Surface laptops and things like that. They already come bundled with Windows 11 on them. So um, it's real. It's coming out, and it's the new game in town. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, uh, yes, oh, also by speaking of end of lifing things, um, I'll remind everyone out there if you're still kicking around a copy of Windows uh, of Counterface Free version 2017 and earlier, um, all right, actually, a free doesn't really come with versions, but if you've got a free that's based on the old CBA databases, so uh, from Counterface 2017 and earlier, or if you're using Counterface 2017, uh, we are turning off the FTP access on October 30th, which means you will not be able to post backups or publish mobile reports after that date. So please uh, upgrade or um, you know get yourself to a newer version one way or another before that date because we gotta kind of tighten up the uh, uh, you know the server security. It's it's just one of those things where like you know for as many new things as we're supporting, we need to close a few doors just behind. You know we don't don't let all the uh, automated attacks come in all the day. So uh, I, I see how busy our firewall is just repulsing script kitties all day long, and and we need to you know lighten the load on it a little bit. So uh, we are ending support for. Counterface 2017 on October 30th. Please, um, yep, upgrade before then. Contact uh, contact us if you need any help on that. Uh, but I, I'm looking forward to kind of just committing to the new stuff, which is uh, Counterface 2020 and, and beyond databases, uh, the ones that are based on SQLite, which are much much faster anyway. So uh, let's do that. Um, all right, let's see what's going on. 
Um, <laughs> Agent DeCamp says, I would tell my younger self to get the barcode scanner ASAP. Yeah, no, that's that that's definitely... Um, <laughs> if, if barcode scanners even existed when we were doing comic base, I, I would have been the very first thing I did. Uh, weird thing about barcode scanners is I had to be dragged kicking and screaming into, uh, into getting them. I mean, it wasn't until comic base 7 or 8 when um, we we really started you know, supporting them or caring about them, whatever else. Uh, we started getting questions from people uh, in, in shows to say, well, are you guys going to support barcode scanners? I'm like, yeah, I guess, but I mean, who's got a barcode scanner? This is something like like three people on the planet have. Um, and uh, little did I know, uh, we uh, contracted out with a company, uh, uh, imported a scanner cl- um, uh, called a Manhattan barcode scanner back in the, in the 90s at some point. And by the end of that decade, we were the number one seller of that particular model of barcode scanner in the United States. Um, so yeah, it wound up being a much bigger thing than I thought they were. Um, but uh, um, yeah, uh, some some interesting ideas for barcodes, by the way, on in the horizon. Let's, we'll talk about that in another show. But uh, yeah, that definitely barcodes help a lot. Um, okay, so other things going on. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, the the main thing I want to do, and by the way, if you have questions that you'd like to answer during the show, please post them to the chat under, um, if you do the at sign comic base TV, it'll help them pop out so I can see them more easily as things go scrolling by. But the more or less the theme of this show is some uh, things that I, you know, that a lot of people don't know that comic base can do that I at least find kind of cool. Um, and uh, which, you know, I, I think I would definitely share is like, you know, cool tips to, to, to a buddy if, if I were, you know, showing them how to get their collection around. This isn't like a full on tutorial of how to do everything in comic base, um, but it is some th- stuff that like, uh, hey, you know, this is kind of neat. And so I thought I'd share a few things like that. One thing that uh, comes to mind with all of this is we're getting to launch a new a version of comic base. And you know, the problem with, with things like the live stream is, in a way, it's like the guys who need the info the least are the guys who show up at the live stream. I mean, you guys are already, like, the top-tier u- users of comic base. You guys already know 95 98% of the product, um, and you're trying to eke out that little extra cool thing or give suggestions on how to make it even cooler um, going forward. But uh, at the same time, I, I took a call this week from a guy who, you know, had our top-of-the-line archive edition, had a barcode scanner the whole uh, nine yards. He's like, yeah, the jump command's a little frustrating. Isn't there a better way to enter comic books? I'm like, well, you could do add by inventory or add by barcode, you know, and it would just, you could batch them all in at once. And it's like, and I'm like, eh, how, how did you not, I mean, you, you bought it, the thing from us. It has a getting started sheet on it. It says, you know, here's how you do it if you want to do it fast. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's always frustrating for those of us who've already been down the road and kind of learned the terrain to kind of remember what it was like not having been that guy. And to try to you know figure out how to you know set up everything so that it's easiest for um, for new users to start acting like they're professionals from the word go. It's it's actually a really good challenge for anyone who's designing anything, uh, particularly computer software. Um, so uh, we're going to be trying a number of things for the next version of Comic Base. Um, there will be. Um, the kind of tips that we, you know, if we are taking over your computer as part of like a remote help session, usually after we solve your problem and say, well, hey, would you mind if we checked a few things for you and maybe we can get a couple things set up for you in a way that would be very helpful. And we'll usually lead people through things like making sure their backups are configured right and making sure that their update settings are the way that, you know, we certainly encourage you to have them. Um, and, and a couple other things like that, you know, you know, make sure it's set up for use with Sidekick. Um, that, um, you know, it feels like they're not super hard to do, but you maybe don't think that they're important or you maybe, uh, like for instance, there, there's perfectly good reasons why the defaults in the content updates are to not allow it to do corrections because you never want the corrections to be destructive unless the user knows what they're getting into. But uh, we're adding kind of a tutorial level to the next version of Comic Base, which kind of says, well, look, here's why we would suggest you definitely allow us to make corrections. But if you don't want to, here's what you would, you know, you click the other button and it won't do that. Um, so we're trying to, you know, spring load a couple of these things. But I find that even though there's like three screens max, you know, with very short, you know, a couple sentences each, you know, on these on these screens, I find that by the third one, I'm just looking for the button that makes the screen go away. It's like, yeah, 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 whatever, next. You know, uh, you know, and that's just kind of a common thing. So when we get to the final screen, it says, yeah, hey, if you want to learn more, here's a bunch of resources. The last thing anyone wants to know, you, you want to sit down and start using the program. And so a lot of the game when you're starting out with any of this stuff is how do we trick you into learning new cool things about the program, you know, as we go. 
Um, and uh, so, I mean, there, there's a number of things we're trying. Uh, we're considering doing uh, various types of uh, hints and tips screens, which, you know, again, the, the cool thing is you can occasionally learn something. The bad news is that if it's in your way, like if you had intended to be working at that point, then it's just something where like, how do I make this tip screen go away? I mean, everyone's probably had Windows tips come at them or for some app you used, and you kind of look through the first one or two and then you're like, ah, get out of my face. Um, and that's kind of the way it goes. Um, in a way, it'd be great if there were things in Counterface that made you wait a long time, uh, at which point it you know, would be easy to throw tips at you. I mean, uh, now I'm saying it out loud, it's like maybe that's something we should like program into like content updates. You know, so that you know it, it runs tips during the content update because it's, it, there's only a couple things in Comface where you're waiting for any real length of time. Uh, one of the problems we had with uh, Comface 2020, people, see, uh, what happened to the startup music? You know, we used to have this big fanfare. So, you know, it lasted like seven and a half seconds or six and a half seconds, and the answer was, well, in most people's modern computers, Comface launches way before that and so you're just listening to you know some music play whereas the music was meant to disguise how long it was taking to load um but uh, so we cut in the went in we kind of cut that out but uh yeah i'd love to find some ways of just spring loading some of these learning into the program in ways that doesn't annoy you um but you know anyway other other ways of getting news out to folks you know whether it's videos or tips of the week or or you know or, or you know uh you know you know tips and tricks newsletters whatever it is i'd love to find a way to kind of skill up the general comic base user population I mean, let me, uh, I've been babbling for long enough. Let me take a quick look at the chat here. Uh, hey, Andrew, nice to make you, uh, nice to see you. Finally, we live, live stream. Hail. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, Comp Base Steve, how about a few Easter eggs for our amusement? You know, there still are a few in there. Um, I believe, God, I believe there's even the secret Bucky. Uh, if if you guys don't know what that one is, uh, maybe at some point someone will get me drunk enough and I'll tell them. Um, but uh, there, there's there's a couple things. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Is, uh, is it possible to have a custom media type so we can make a database of thing, other things we collect like action figures? Uh, not really, but uh, that said, I mean, well, I don't think we can make a generic -y media type. That said, could we extend the uh, the database to work with other other types of things like, uh, I don't know, sports cards, non-sports cards, action figures, toys, um, um, <laughs> and there were like two others um, that, that we certainly thought about going into uh, when we did Comic Face 2020. Absolutely we could, um, as long as we can figure out a way to make it make sense from a business case. Um, we definitely, as soon as we went from more than one uh, media type, uh, with you know, as soon as we went to Comic Face 2020 where it was not just comic books, it was comics and magazines and books, uh, it, you might have noticed that it's it's much easier to scale to other types of media, but for each one of those types of media, the thing that held us back at the end was we we had to be able to put together a business case as to why we should be in that field and how we can possibly get the content to work with it, so that there's a, kind of a a nice loop of content coming to us that we can give out. Um, like for instance, um, uh, with books, we're not trying to, you know, at least not initially, we're not trying to do every book that's ever been published. There are tens of millions of them at this point. Um, but, um, you know, it, it started out as a way to give a home to those books that we had in comic base before, but weren't really comic books at all. Uh, so, for instance, one of our customers is the guy who has the world, you know, world's record for the largest comic book collection. And the Guinness folks decided they're only going to count one comic each of every you know, type. So if he had 30,000 copies of Spawn vs. Batman, it still only counts as one. Well, the other thing they're not counting is they're not counting things that aren't really comic books, even if they were in comic base. So, for instance, if it was just a pinup book of, uh, even if it was a comic artist, you know, and, and he, but if he didn't have a story in it, that doesn't count. Uh, if it's a book like Seduction of the Innocent, which is uh, the, the basis or one of the great bases for the comic uh, code authority, um, that one's very important from comic history standpoint. It's collectible, but it was not a comic book itself. Same thing goes for magazines, like so Comics Buyer's Guide or Comics Journal. Uh, we wanted to be able to take those out of comic base and still give you a place to flag them in your collection, but you know, stop treating them as if they were comics. Um, but anyway, so those ones were pretty easy. 
and they also had enough bleed over directly from the comics category that they kind of fill themselves in in a way that's interesting for a lot of our users and ourselves and, and comic shops and things like that. So, I mean, if you've got a bunch of comics, you might have issues of Comics Buyer's Guide you wanted to track or Wizard or something. Uh, you might have pinup books and so forth. So even though we're not trying to fill in every book that's ever happened, if we filled in just the ones that were directly related to comics, we still have something of value. Um, when you get things like uh, action figures, it's okay. It's, it's still of interest. We could maybe still get there, but there's more of a challenge for us to get tied into um, a catalog source that we can legitimately use and also get some kind of basis for pricing to at least start the discussion. And then the, the biggest problem we had with action figures was there was a really limited number of folks that we, you know, in our surveys could determine that were interested in cataloging uh, a lot of their action figures. Um, uh, so, I mean, it, it really comes down to a question of like, well, you know, would you even pay $10 or $20 to have a program that catalogs your action figures? And I think the number one program on the market that cataloged action figures when we were looking around had sold like a couple hundred copies. It was like, Ugh, that, that's that's grim. So it doesn't make us want to invest a ton of money in it. But um, that isn't to say that, you know, it isn't to say no. And it's certainly been on our mind and things could change. So I'd, I'd say we're watching. Uh, right now we've got higher priorities with other things we're doing, but I wouldn't you know, I, I'm, I'm, it's not even just re, it's not even revisiting the whole issue. It's just I'm waiting for an opening where it makes sense from us from, from a business point of view, at which point I would love to jump into some of these other things. But we need to be able to make it make sense. OK, that was a long answer to a short question, but you know, we'll take it. Um, let's see here. Uh, Asian Camp says you can put in a list of new functions update file like which shows what's new. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that does help a lot for the new stuff. Uh, so, for instance, we try to make a lot of, you know, a lot of noise about when we launch a new version of Comic Base. There's always a what's new page for the new version, and uh, that kind of illustrates what well, here's the cool things. We'll put out newsletters and do things like that. So, when, and when you're talking about a handful of new features, that's always really good. But at this point, I realize we've got 30 years almost of history built into Comic Base of just the basic stuff and it's like how do you bring in the the really noobs in to really even get what's going and it's it's an ongoing challenge but oh, we'll, we'll share some things and we'll get to it um all right let's see here uh digga, 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 digga. oh um andrew Ed, uh, d uh, d god andrew i i i hope i'm saying your name right uh dentrement um um I said, can we talk about newsstands that are printed on newsprint instead of glossy paper? Feel like they should be classified as a variant. Um, absolutely, we accepted a number of them this week. Um, uh, if there's a, like a paper stock variant or a cover price variant, anything other than just it had a barcode or not a barcode, it makes me very interested in enlisting that as a variant. I mean, if, if it's a qualitative difference on any level uh, between the whole things, I, then I'm I'm an easy mark as far as like absolutely treat that as a variant. Um, once upon a time, back in the early 80s, when they started printing comics on something other than newsprint, um, uh, the indie comics started this around in the early 80s, and they say, oh, this one's on Mando paper, and I, I used to even know what Mando paper was, but it was like the stuff that, you know, would actually take color, you know, and, and print it vividly, and uh, as opposed to just being garbagey looking and, you know, and self-disintegrating due to its high acid content in 20 years, uh, but they also used to charge an extra 40, 50 cents for that, you know, for that uh, copy as opposed to the uh, the newsstand copy so um but yeah no i'm 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 absolutely i'm all ears as far as that goes um you know if there's any kind of paper stock binding any kind of difference like that that's fine i, I just I, I i i i i waffle you know quite a bit when you're talking about just simply well this one had a barcode and this one didn't because it was distributed through there versus distributed over there um because it kind of puts you into a weird place where you're you're you know, you're treating distribution differences as if they're relevant to the content, and it's like, eh. you know, if if the book itself doesn't tell, then then it's it's hard to make that case that that's substantial. Uh, for instance, uh, after 1993, I believe, when D uh, Diamond uh, just you know said, "Look, guys, if we're going to handle you at all, you have to have a barcode on your stuff." At that point, then all difference between newsstand and bark and uh, direct market editions just disappeared. There just was no way to distinguish at all. And then you're saying, well, then what was I tracking the whole time anyway? Was it really just whether it went to 7-Eleven or it went to my local comic store? If so, eh, I don't know. I'm, I'm less I'm less convinced on that one. But anyway, um, 
Let's see. And Lance says, if you're expanding to cards, make sure you have editors who love cards. Ab absolutely. It goes for anything. It's You're going to do a crummy job on anything you kind of half-ass. You need to have someone who really cares about whatever you're doing. And some of these, some of these areas are just fast. So you, you've got to be careful before you, you take that first step because it's, it's, it's like wading into the ocean. It's like sometimes it's a nice gradual step down. Sometimes you're stepping right off of a sea shelf and, and you're right into the deep end. And, and I don't necessarily want to go on that one. Uh, all right. So let's see here. Do, 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 do. Um, all right. Moving on. Baxter paper. I remember that. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that I, um, that, that I liked. By the way, conversationally, one of my favorite kind of conversational gambits, uh, if you ever want to just introduce people around at a party is, uh, just to say to everyone, it's like, all right, well, all right, so say your name, you know, where you work or what you do or else, and tell me something that's interesting about you that not many people know. It's actually, you know, it's actually kind of a good way to introduce people at parties and actually get conversations out of them. Um, so, you know, you, you know, just, uh, yeah, just, so what this one is, this isn't necessarily the most important, uh, you know, uh, the more, most important features in Counterbase. I, I wouldn't say it by a long stream. Uh, I, I'd say probably the most important feature in Counterbase, if I were going to tell anyone anything, is I'd say one key issue entry. So, um, uh, so for instance, like, let's say, uh, let, let's go to a conventional title like, uh, I don't know, Adventure Comics. Uh, all right, so Adventure Comics. Let's go down to the end so it's at least slightly plausible that I might have a bunch of these. Um, all right, and wait till it you know, catches up to me because I just scrolled through about a million thumbnails it hadn't built before. Good job there, Bickford. All right, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, bail out of this one and go to a, go to an easy one let's go to starfire speaking of speaking of mando of mando paper um or no star reach is the one i was thinking of star reach um all right so let's say i had star reach number 11 through you know 16 right number one tip i would tell anyone to save them time and do great things and everything is click over here on the left hand side to highlight one I can control click to highlight different you know, things like that, or I can just drag and click and highlight a whole range like that. And if I just highlight them like that and type a number on my keyboard from zero to nine, just there's a one, there's a two, there's a three, etc. Uh, it's going to instantly put all those guys as, as you know as I have them in stock with that many issues. Uh, that is that is my favorite most powerful and useful trick in the entire program um if you didn't know that one before thank you're welcome <laughs> i hope you enjoy it because it's the only thing i know that enters comic books even faster than barcoding them um, um you know because if you know if you're like me and you have just a big run of whatever um and they're all organized in order and you tended to have every issue for at least a period of time just highlighting the whole thing they're already probably in near mint just highlight them all hit them on your keyboard boom move on to the next box and you're done um um, the next one I'd say um, is, uh, for instance, um, um, uh, like like, uh, you know, like dragging and drop. Um, so, for instance, let's say uh, let's look over here by the storylines. So you might notice that you know some of these things, like the writer and artist, you know, you know, some of them are a little cramped up. I can't really read them. If you hold your mouse in between columns here, like on writer and artist, you can grab right at the top and resize these any way you want. Like say, I don't use a lot of space for notes, you know, use less space for that and so forth. Uh, or if I use a lot of space for storylines, go and grab them that way. Now, one thing I noticed is I'm trying to say like, you know, because I'll see people who like, and they have all their, um, all their, you know, uh, columns all squished up and everything's really unoptimal and something like that. And I'll say, hey, did you, you, know, you know you can like, you know, just resize them by grabbing this little almost invisible line in between the columns and moving it back and forth. Um, you know, if they hadn't figured that out for themselves, which basically meant that they'd never used Excel before is, is almost really the qualifier on that one. Um, the thing I, I find myself realizing with all my favorite tips or almost all of them is that they're all they all have what's called affordances. They're all little cues that you could do something, but they're really subtle cues. I mean, if none of these things are things that have a ginormous button in the middle of the screen that says to to resize your columns, click this big button. Um, which you know, if there was a ginormous button that said that, it would be it'd be wonderful because you know then people would actually find it. Um, but the problem, of course, then is that there'd be a ginormous button in the middle of your screen, and you know then that's kind of a problem. Um, so, uh, you know, so all these things are, I, I, so an affordance 
is that's, that's interface speak for basically it's a signal that you can manipulate an object or it's a symbol that you can do something uh, a classic one is think of an elevator button uh, so an elevator button it they say you know the psychologist would say it affords pushing uh, because it's raised up from the background you know when you push it down it makes a visible it makes you know you can feel the travel it often lights up to let you know what its state is um, but you, you know you can tell by manipulating it that there's you know there's a, a thing to do sometimes uh, I'll uh, have a strange object where I'm like where the heck do I get to the battery compartment to change out the batteries on this you know toy my kid has or something and what I'm looking for on the back of of this you know object is I'm looking for something that has either little thumb grips on it so that I could you know move it that way that might have a little line you know uh, especially you know uh, that you know would indicate that that it, it will move in a certain direction like a puzzle box or something um, Certainly, if there's a, a you know, if, uh, I was changing the uh, the bag in my in my vacuum the other day, and I was you know, I'm scouring all over the smooth black plastic surface of this iRobot thing, looking for a button I can push or a switch I can move or something that'll let me to you know, it's like oh, here's the thing that if I push this, it swings out the hidden panel, which lets me take out the you know the dust compartment and, and empty it. Uh, but you're looking for these affordances. Uh, in all the things you do, you know, whether it's a door handle or a button or, or you know, or a line between two columns uh, that tells you that there's an action here you could do. So, like I say, all my favorite hidden tricks, the reason they're hidden is they're, they're there, but the affordances are really, really small. So um, let's, uh, let's take another one. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, that, you know, you can highlight stuff like there. And uh, here, the, it really is, it's an invisible affordance. There's nothing here that tells me I could type a number and get to you there. You just have to know it. Um, if I was really, really cool, I'd find some way of, of having some kind of fly out or something, you know, uh, click in there and says, you know, push a number from one, from one to 10 in order to, you know, to set the amount uh, of items in stock. The, the problem, uh, unfortunately, is there's just no place to put that kind of help text uh, in the screen right now. Uh, it's not particularly easy to figure out how to how to fly that in, but if I do ever find something really clever, I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, we used to have that um, in the old find uh, the old, the ancient versions of Coinbase that used a separate find window. There was actually a thing in the toolbar at the bottom we could do, which would let us you know have a message like that, and literally nobody saw it. <laughs> I mean, I don't think uh, there are other things that would tell you, and you can add things to a set by doing things like that. The problem is that when you're looking at a screen, your eye tends to go and figure out what's the live area of the screen, it immediately zooms in on the content part, uh, which in this case immediately kind of starts your eye right here. Because you scan down figures, is this relevant, is this relevant? No, no, no. And you can actually watch this with eye tracking software. Uh, it's basically a little cameras embedded in a screen that was watching where your eyes are going to. And what it can do is it can play back the whole interaction later on and show the heat map. So it actually shows exactly where your eye went as you looked at the screen. When you look at a screen, your eye basically it go, says, eh, nothing there. Immediately goes straight here and it spends all its time in a box that's framed by this live area uh, in the grid right there. It literally, if I put something down here in the bottom, it's great, it's out of the way, and it literally never gets seen. It may as well be invisible. Um, uh, one thing you could do is, if you are uh, selecting on things like that, if I were to immediately make a, something pop up here uh, out of nowhere, it would draw my attention because it'd be a new action on screen that would tell me, hey, uh, type a number from one to 10. And then at that point, my I would go from here, bounce up to where this message was going to be right there, and then I could get back to my work. Problem is, you know, again, possible. Um, it Not a bad one as a hint the first time to learn the behavior. Every other time you did it though, it would cause you the same thing because something popped onto the screen to show you, it would cause your eye to almost involuntarily go there and it becomes super distracting. So all these things are actually kind of tricky to manage is I guess what I'm saying. All right, uh, let's go back to things. Um, uh, oh yeah, so other things that uh, I would tell people just if they didn't know they could do them because they're neat. Um, a lot of people have never known what this little column over here is. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on it. Uh, nope, the mouse magnification is not working on this mouse. Uh, but anyway, the little uh, uh, column just to the left of the picture, it looks like a play arrow. That's the media column. And what it's for is so I can drag in things like digital media or, pic, uh, or um, PDFs or uh, you know, CBR files or you know, digital comics, what have you. 
uh, right onto the title. But one thing you can do, which is really cool, so you can go, like, since if I go to Fantastic Four, I believe I've got the first several of these ones. They used to distribute these in digital format. If it will come up, yeah, let's see. So, for instance, I've got, this is right here, you'll see that it's got um, uh, media icons appear for here's issue one, two, three, four, etc. So if I click on this, it's going to immediately launch the digital copy I've got of Fantastic Four number one. They used to, Marvel used to sell these on as PDFs on a big thing, and here is Fantastic Four number one, uh, presented in really really crappy scan. But you know the good news is with all the original ads, so you know there's that. Um, so uh, so you can read it in its original. Um, uh, and uh, at one point, Marvel had like the first, you know, 400 or 500 issues of Fantastic Four on CD for like 20 bucks. And uh, that, that felt like a great deal to me at the time. So I, I bought all of those. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but you can drag those in, transfer them in. Another thing you can do, which is kind of neat. Uh, and by the way, the rule on, on dragging anything in is just if it's named the same as the picture itself, as the item itself, um, it'll get picked up. So if I want to have a picture for Fantastic Four number one, you just call it 1.jpg, drag it onto the title, it'll suddenly appear as your picture. If I've got a PDF, in this case, of, of Fantastic Four number one, all you do is call it 1.pdf, drag it onto the title, it'll get filed away in the right place, and then it, it'll become a link right there. One thing that's really kind of neat, though, is let's go to something really strange. Like, let's go to... Uh, do 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 do. Let me pull up a web browser. Uh, let's pick a movie. Uh, Dark Man. Uh, if you guys remember that one? Um. Um. Okay, classic trailer. Dark Man, the official Liam Neeson trailer. All right. What's up? So obligatory commercial for something. Uh, what they want? All right. Okay. So this is gonna be a trailer. All right. Did you know that you can grab? right in the title bar of your browser links drag them down to your desktop and it makes a thing called blur 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 dark man trail etc right okay so yeah you've probably have seen that before so if you wanted to kind of have your links off off to the side you could get to them that way well this file even though it doesn't show you this way is actually called blah 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 dot url it's a it's a it's a file like any other kind of file now if i call this number one Really, it's called number one dot URL, but it'll never show you the dot URL part, even if you say show me file extensions. But hey, we trust me, your file system knows. So let's go to the Darkman movie. Uh, Darkman, uh, Darkman magazine. Uh, eh, close enough. I don't know if there was an official Darkman movie adaptation, but if not, we'll just tie it onto Darkman Volume One. If I take this one, drag it down here to number one, it's suddenly going to grow a icon for the media, right? And so now if I go ahead and let's go forward, let's go back, so you'll see it's right there. If I click on that, it's going to immediately go and pull up the Darkman movie trailer, which I'm going to put five seconds of before Who? I decide that... No foolish heroics, if you please. Yes. But anyway, so if you're of a mind to, you can associate all kinds of crazy content with your stuff in comic base um uh, so i mean you could use this to put together you know uh, movie collections you could you know you know and it doesn't even need to be uh, on your your hard drive itself it literally could be just a link to something that's up in uh, up in the cloud someplace and if you drag it onto um onto the appropriate place in comic base then comic base starts adding acting as your digital you know mu bleh, your digital media library anyway i think that's kind of cool and uh, I would definitely add that as one of the uh, the tips I would show a friend. Let's do a quick check of the chat, see how we're doing. Um, <sighs> lol, a new word. What did what what did people say? I don't know. Um, oh, affordance, the quality of property and object that defines its possible uses. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it, it's, I didn't make it up. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know news about me, but that that actually was my gig at Apple. I was I was the UX guy. Um, anyway, so. Um, Let's see here. Um, uh, Andrew said I dragged a bunch of C bear files, found it slowed my system down too much, so I removed them. Um, shouldn't. Um, so what it does when it um, when it uh, is looking, you know, let's go ahead and show. Um, uh, just pay attention to the upper left uh, upper left hand corner of the grid area as I go to new titles. You'll notice that when I go to a new title, if I look really closely, 
there's like a moment where it shows like a, a temporary thumbnail and then a little cursor will spin down and then it'll draw the little thumbnails of the actual icons themselves. It'll do that the first time, but then when you go back the second time, it's, it's dang near instantaneous because it's already made the thumbnails and cached them. It doesn't do any caching of the thumbnails for CBR, CBZ, and so forth files. At that point, all it's really doing is at the same time it's saying, do I have a picture for this thing? It's saying, do I have any images uh, or whatever else for or, uh, media, you know, PDFs, uh, zip files. I mean, it's, it's looking for half dozen media files that are stored in exactly the right place. And if it does, if it sees them, it puts an icon there. If it doesn't, it doesn't put an icon there. But the whole process is is crazy fast. You know, it's it's um, you know, it, it should be able to do you know 100, 200 of them a second um, to even do that check. So I mean, it, having them or not having them shouldn't honestly checking is is it should be exactly as much time whether you've got it or not got it because uh, it's going to do the check anyway to see if there are new, any new pictures um, but um, so yeah it, it, and they're not in if you know they're not uh, being launched until you launch them um, at which point they launch in their, whatever their own uh, normal um, the handler is so for instance if they were PDFs and they were going to launch in Adobe Acrobat if they're CBR files they're going to read in whatever CBR file reader you've got um, so yeah, I mean it shouldn't slow down your computer at all um, at least not the cataloging but you know it's up to you um, all right let's see here uh, let's see uh, other cool things that I would tell people about uh, let's see here, uh, display items after saving. Oh yeah, I like this one. Um, all right, so let's go and first of all, let's pop up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab, uh, I think I can do the picture in picture without compromising too much of things just to make this, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be cool. Let me see if I move me down to the bottom right corner, that definitely should be out of the way. All right, let's do this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say add a few comic books by inventory and, um, you know, give an excuse to actually do some of my own work while I'm on a live stream with you guys. All right, so if you've got a barcode scanner, uh, I would definitely, you know, the way I'd enter almost everything is, is you know, come down here onto items, say add by barcode, or if you're me, just hit control I, right? At which point it's going to bring up a window that looks like this, right? And I'm going to reach behind myself and grab a couple of comic books. All right, and let's go ahead and let's scan a couple of these suckers. Ooh, I wonder if I can be really cool and use the overhead camera here. Um, <laughs> now, can, if I do the overhead and I picture and picture it, do I? Which one source do I get? Let's find out. Um, yeah, so that okay, that's me picture and pictured with the overhead. Now, if I go switch over to the camera, uh, to that one, no, I used to know how to do this. I swear to God, <laughs> I'll try this one more time. So I'm, now it's me picture and pictured with myself. If I now switch over to camera two, no, nah, I'm still picture and pictured with myself. Ah, I'll just admit I don't know how to use this uh, switcher setup yet, but I'll figure it out. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and beep in a couple of these boys over here and we'll play it out as it goes. So... There's one, here's another one, and let's do one more. All right, cool. All right, so uh, so I got three comic books entered in there that just came in uh, from the indexers over here. And again, the affordance is there, but think of where your eyes go in terms of eye tracking. Your eye is basically here. It zips over to there because something new appears, especially something new and graphical. And by the way, if you're interested in eye tracking stuff, if anything has a face on it, particularly a baby's face, <laughs> your eye will go to it. Um, it is crazy how hardwired we are uh, for that sort of thing. Um, we, we are looking for faces all day long as humans. Um, so anyway... So basically, you're looking here, your eye zips over there, yep, that's a picture, your eye goes back to here, lather, rinse, repeat. And at that point, your eye's probably off task entirely because you're lining up the next comic book. But anyway, one thing you're, in one place your eye is never at during this whole process is down here. And so that's why I'm going to tell you, you know, some things we've hidden in plain sight down at the bottom here. First one is, says display items after saving. What that means is that once I get done adding these guys to my inventory, it's going to pull them up again so I can do other things to them. 
Uh, the second one over here is print divider labels for new titles. Now, I print divider labels for everything that comes to my collection. I, I have an investment in divider labels, and at some point when you're really bored, we can have a show talking about how we, you know, what solvents we use to recycle them after they've had 80,000 stickers on them and whatever else. But, but yeah, no, we, we just kind of bit the bullet ages ago and, and, and invested in several thousand dividers. Uh, so that every time we have a new section, it always gets, you know, it gets bagged, gets boarded. There's a uh, ID label that gets printed for it. It gets its own section in the whole thing. And when we pull the last, you know, when we're selling them, when we pull the last comic out of a divider section, the divider gets pulled, it gets thrown in the to be recycled uh, pile and the whole thing goes round and round. But what it does do, uh, despite all the prep work, putting it in there and a certain amount of expense for things like labels and, and initially buying divider labels it makes retrieval of comic books really really fast and I, I value my time more than I value most things so uh, that's that's where we always prioritize this stuff after and we actually run enough stopwatch tests on the stuff at the office um, to figure out where where our money is at in terms of the overall process and and, and yeah labeling and, and divider labels for everything they absolutely pay off especially if you're paying your employees to do the filing for you anyway but back to this whole thing so you, you scanned in a bunch of books um, you've got them all ready to go there I'm gonna check off display items after saving and display uh, print dot vitor labels for new title and I they're gonna remember what your check box was so the next time you go here they'll all just be in whatever state you had them all right so I'm gonna go ahead and hit save it's gonna go ahead and add these to inventory now it's doing this on my fake database so I have to remember to add these to my real database later on because this is just the live stream database. Uh, because there are two new titles uh, in this whole thing that it had never seen in uh, in the inventory for this one before, it's going to go ahead and, and automatically print uh, divider labels for those guys. So I'll go ahead and let it do that. That sound you hear right now is those labels rolling off of my printer. But the other thing you'll see down here is we've got that same list of three has just been pulled up now as a find. All right, now why did I bother doing this? Well, a couple things. So um, what a lot of people do with this at this point is they'll do a quick change and say things like, all right, I'm going to quick change, um, which would be control G if you care about these things, uh, is the fastest way to get quick change up. And I could say things like, uh, you know, I'm going to put these all in box number, you know, or, you know, I could use one of my custom fields as box number. And I could say these are all going to be in box three, right? Uh, and then boom, everything I added was all in box three. That's one thing I could do with them. Uh, another thing that I do every single time uh, is I hit, you know, I click in the list, I hit control A is select all, and then I hit F6. F6, by the way, if you look at it, is t uh, will print ID labels. All right, and so then that comes up, slap return on that guy, wait a couple seconds for them to roll off my printer, and then what's going to happen at that point is I'm going to go over and you know bag and board all these suckers while that's going on. Uh, by the time I've bagged and board them, all my labels are done printing. And at that point, I'm going to be going ahead and slapping ID labels on the fronts of all these guys. And the divider labels, I'll set them in place. They're ready to be filed. And when they are, they're going to be just gorgeous and in perfect order. Um, the labels, by the way, look like this. Put them down to the camera. Uh, these guys over here, whoa, no, the camera's not in autofocus mode, so I'm going to put it right there. These are the ID labels. They uh, tell you what's what. They've got their own barcode on them, so even if you're looking at comics that never had a barcode on them before, you can pull them up very quickly. If I'm looking at the physical comic again, it'll take you to that record in the database. Um, and most importantly, though, is when you're talking about things like this is static season one as opposed to static, as opposed to static shock, as opposed to static season two. Uh, this is Superman Suicide Squad sixth series annual 2021. I mean, if I'm looking at just the book, would I know if this was Suicide Squad sixth series? Bloody unlikely, even for me. Uh, but if I've got the you know the ID label slapped on the bag right at the top center as I'm filing through things, I can find everything and I can file them very very quickly. Uh, so that winds up being like a, a the major workflow for us when we get new comics in. But uh, the important thing I want to share with all y'all is um, when you're doing that add by inventory uh, over here. Have a look at the display items after saving and whether or not you want to pr automatically print divider labels for new titles because they're just they're just cool. You know, uh, it, this t these two things take a lot of work out of my day doing things. By the way, there was a, 
a change in comic base um, in the last point rev. I think it was in, we got into 21.0.3 that uh, you might have seen it when you open up your databases. It creates a bunch of new fields in your um, in your issues table. One of the things that it will do is it makes it possible so that when those labels come out, they co they will appear not in alphabetical order, but in exactly the same order as the stack that you've got in your hand right there, which then makes that process of bagging and boarding them and putting the right label on them much faster because there's no more hunting for, well, in this stack of 30 books, where was Suicide Squad? It's exactly next to the other label that was exactly next to the other one. So um, anyway, that's just one of those things. All right, let's do a quick check of chat and we'll get on to other things. Um, yeah, see, babies and animals always steal the focus on stage. Uh, yeah, there's... Uh, <laughs> he's talking about eye tracking on that one. Uh, it is funny because... Um, like I say, we are wired up like you can't believe to look for faces, uh, especially babies and for guys in particular, there are other things we will look for, but babies still attention goes. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, would I uh, consider making it possible to run one collection report to include all three media types instead of three separate collection reports? Pretty please. Um, it's, it's hard to do. Um, we talked about this before. One of the, one of the things I, you know, it makes me a little sad because I, I looked in different ways of trying to make it happen and, and it's not super practical. Uh, is if I'm going to let the media types be different from each other at all, in other words, uh, let them have different fields, let them have things that are important and not just kind of have like a, a least common denominator set between all three, um, then it becomes very hard to uh, have reports that include all things at once, even if you do elaborate things to stack them together. Um, it is technically possible. I mean, it, it could be done. The thing you'd pay for in order to do it, though, is you'd get, have to give up the things that were unique about one media type or another. On, they couldn't be on the report. Um, uh, so what we do right now is uh, when you uh, fire off a particular report, you know, if you want a list of your magazines, you print the report for magazines. You want a list of the ones for comics, you print the report for comics. Um, you know, if you wanted an everything collection report, I'd have to limit it to all just fields that were common between them all. If that was okay for everyone, I could do it. Um, I'm, I'm a, I don't know. Is that better or worse than just saying, eh, print, print off? You know, just hit print three times with you know, with cycling between options. Um, uh, I mean, it's it, it's a good question. I mean, I, I I don't know the answer on that one. Uh, what so all I'm talking about is if you say print, and you know, here if we choose a media type, I'm gonna say you know comic books, and I choose like you know collection report, um, right? That's gonna give me a list, right? And if I want, you know, I, I could you know choose what I want, hit print. And I'd go and I'd go to books and I'd hit print and then I'd go over to magazines and hit print and I'd get three different reports off rolling off my uh, printer. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it'd be neat if we could have more things that do everything at once. But uh, I think about the only thing in comic base that really works that way is the collection statistics uh, over here is um and here we really did extract it down to just what's what's the whole uh what what is unique to you know wh what things are common between all things and we just went with money um so you can say you know uh, if i say the collection statistics you know by default it looks at your comic books you know here's how many book you know what i've got in terms of books here's what i've got in terms of magazines but you'll notice that no matter what type of media i've got they always have a publisher they always have a quantity they always have you know whatever these breakdowns are are always common between them and matter of fact the ones that aren't drop off but in terms of the the uh, quantities i do there these are always um available bet between them all which is why i can say show me the entire collection value at which point it sums up all the different values for all my different types of things. It shows the valuations across things because everything has a value, everything has a cost, and everything has a price. But immediately at that point, it has to blank out the breakdowns because the breakdowns don't exist for everything. For instance, uh, books don't have, you know, books don't come from Golden Age, Silver Age, and Atomic Age, and so forth. There is no, there's no concept of that with books. Um, uh, you can't do... Um, 
uh, you know, the, the, there's uh, mature readers exist for, for all those things, but, but there's any number of other things that don't exist. Uh, cover dates, for instance, don't exist for books, so you can't break things down by cover date. Uh, cover price, same. Uh, uh, books have a list price, which is similar, but it's not exactly the same. Um, but anyway, so yeah, a lot of those things you can't, um, they're not common between all the media types, so it's, it's impossible to make them reportable in a common way without some real strangeness on the report. Um, but anyway, it's a great question. I mean, it's it's worth revisiting when when we've got a, a another take on it that we can throw at it. Um, all right, Oro asks, uh, what brand printer am I using, please? I am using at the moment. Uh, let's have a look at it. Have I got an overhead view? No, that's my chroma key. <laughs> let's see if it will stretch over here. You're looking at my knees right now. No, the camera will not stretch. Ah, I'm just going to yank it and pull it over. This is the lovely, the one, the only, <laughs> the very badly shown at this point, uh, is a Dymo Label Writer t uh, Twin Turbo. The reason I like this guy is you can load this sucker up with two different types of, you know, right now I've got two of the same type of media in them. And what it does is as soon as it, roll, it runs out of this roll, it cycles over this roll and vice versa. So I never have to stop and switch wise. You can load them up with, um, you can load them up with different, uh, you know, address labels and shipping labels and so forth. But because of the way we do printing around here, that winds up never being useful. Uh, and then the thing I really love about it is because we order so many labels at once whenever we do anything, uh, we actually manage to get the whole thing for free. Um, uh, a company called Label City was doing a promotion with Dymo where for a while where it's like for every like 10 cases of labels you're ordering from them, you'd get, you know, you could get a low end printer, you, you get 20, you get a higher end printer, you order like, you know, 50, which is what we would be doing on our orders. It'd be like, what do you have you want? The stock, here you go. And I think we wound up scoring something like four or five different printers over the years from those guys on that during the course of that demo promotion because we do a lot of labels in here <laughs> anyway that's that um uh it says uh this guy this is labels and color as opposed to just black and white is the question uh no that's the one heartache of the dymo label printer is it's only black and white it's technically grayscale and the other thing is if you leave them on the comics for just years and years and years like decade or more uh, particularly if you've got a lot of temperature fluctuations they are going to fade on you so um i uh, that is the the downside of the dymo labels um, it's not a big problem for me on almost everything because I try to, you know, I, I, I've got about 55,000 comics now down from 62,000 before COVID. <laughs> but, uh, but we, you know, we move stuff in, we move stuff out at a, at a decent clip. Uh, so there aren't too many labels that have faded away to, you know, almost nothing over the years. There's some, but, and, and I even find that kind of interesting to say, well, what have I had so long that it's faded away? Uh, if you go with a label, a laser printer, uh, label, it will not do that. But for me, the thing that really helps over everything is just the convenience to be able to have a label pop out, flip it up, throw it on and not have to run over or go to a printer. Uh, that just beats anything for me, uh, just in terms of just time. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, and uh, Andrew says, uh, can we change the aspect ratio of the cover on the label? A uh, double page cover looks really squashed. Uh, no, I'm afraid you can't. Um, it's, uh, I, there are many things I like about our report engine. Our, so the report engine we use, it's probably the number one report engine on the planet. It's called Crystal Reports. It has many, many powerful features. It does really nice stuff if you really, really baby the hell out of it. And its graphics handling is crap. It's really, really bad. Uh, it is, it is so unbelievable what we have to do to get this label to appear, to appear on that label. You you can't even imagine it. <laughs> uh, but basically, at the end of the day, we um, uh, we've got a rectangle that we are squishing uh, a graphic into, and we can get it so it doesn't, you know, so it doesn't just, you know, stretch. You know, uh, you're talking about double covers. So when you take a comic book that is, is like a wraparound cover, and so you you've got, instead of having a tall portrait type graphic, you've got a very wide graphic. What winds up happening in order to not distort it so it becomes very long is you wind up squishing it down so it's just a tiny little smear in the middle. Um, probably the best we can do on that on that scale. Uh, I can't 
I can't think of another way to go because we don't have a lot of flexibility on relaying out the label in real time as we go on the whole thing. We, we do a lot. Uh, we, we, we are cheating so hard to get things like the, uh, the font to, um, you can't really see it in this, but if you ever looked at your labels, uh, you'll see that like it prints larger if you've got uh, less text on it and it'll you know, shrink down the font down quite a ways if it has to, to get you know, uh, very, very busy storylines to fit and things like that. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff like that, but uh, we're working under very tight tolerances and it's, just, it's really hard to do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question though. All right, let's see here. Uh, do -do 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 -do. Uh, okay, Lance asks, how does the print ID labels command work when there are multiple quantities of the same book header? Great question. Uh, let's go ahead and show that. So let's say I've got, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, all right, so let's go, here's, here's fancy. Eh, let's, go to, let's go to a different series we haven't beat up yet. Um, Dark Knight Returns. All right, uh, nah, that's the wrong Dark Knight I was thinking of. All right, Dark Knight returns the Golden Child. Here we go. Okay, so let's say I'm going to add in quantity one for a bunch of these guys. I'm, you know, I already had one for this. All right, I'm going to go and highlight all these guys now. Actually, I'm going to put uh, two on this one. I'm going to put three on this one. All right. If I go and I highlight down everything, by default, the one that's zero over here will just not print print a label. Um, uh, if I print uh, like this, uh, t well, typically, well, uh, actually, I, I take that back. I think if you if you say print it, uh, and you, you're choosing it manually, I think it figures you wouldn't have tried to print it if you didn't want the label, give or take. Uh, I think that's I think that's accurate. Um, I, I know we've gone back and forth in design sessions on this one, but may, maybe I'm wrong. Oh no, I, I guess it decided. No, I don't have one in stock, so it's not going to print one. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so print how many you've got in stock by default. But it also knows, like, let's say I just add, I had a bunch before, I added another one to it. I don't necessarily want to get three labels for number 1D, because maybe the thing, the reason I'm, I'm highlighting that at all is just because I've added just one more copy. So what it does these days is when you print, I say preview, uh, so I can see it, and I'll move this over on the screen. So some of these items have more than one copy in stock. Do you want these to print labels for every copy you have in stock? Or pressing no, we'll print a single label for each item, regardless of the quantity in stock. And so you pick yes or no. So if I say yes, it's going to kick out one. If I say no, it's going to print two labels for 1B, and it's going to print three for 1D. So um, anyway, that's the answer, and uh, so forth. And I just previewed that and saw it on the screen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Whatever is good for you to create the entire database. So uh, trying to uh, trying to parse on uh, Andre's comment here. It says when you go to a new title, this creates all the thumbnails for that title. Is it possible to add a button for whatever is good for you to create for the entire database? Um. Hmm. The quick answer is no. Um. So. What he's talking about, um, and, and I showed some of this ahead of time, is there's a little. See so here, here's some of the, the, the you know the the ghosts inside the machine on some of the stuff. So if I go and take any old picture, right, like this one right here, and I right click and I say show picture file, I can pull up where on the disk this actual picture file exists. So here's the raw picture file, and you'll see for issue, you know. 1B, it, I got it, it's 1,900 pixels by 3,000 pixels. That's, that's a big old picture, if, if you can make that out at all. Now, I don't need a 1,000, you know, a 2,000 pixel by 3,000 pixel image to show it in the grid here. As a matter of fact, that would be super slow if I did. So what we do instead is, and you can see this, um, by default, it's going to be, you can see the location under File, File Tools. Let me go pull this up manage pictures and movies all right and this by default is where it's going to store your pictures and movies so in my case it's c users peter bickford dropbox shared cb data and by default it's going to keep a thumbnails in the same kind of place now let me go to the appropriate folder on my machine because my machine is a little special because i'm running an admin copy of some stuff so there's, I have a couple extra folders that you guys don't have because we also have to have a shared folder for all of the comic based staff that sh stores our picture library and it's really bad if we share you know move our thumbnails into it like you know <laughs> like it would be for everybody else because you know our Dropbox would be crazy with thumbnails so we we 
we, we, we have a, the ability in our, in our copies to have our thumbnails be someplace else. But let me go ahead and pull up where we've really got them, and I'll, I'll show that to you. Uh, let's see here. C, users. Excuse me for a moment. I'm actually puddling around on my disk to get to the right place. In the, I, I don't want to be showing you every folder on my disk, so I'm just going to putz for just a second. Um, uh, where are we at? Uh, documents. Peter Bickford. Documents. Yep. Human computing. And... Oh, no, darn. <laughs> users. It's users public. <laughs> All right. Users document. Public documents. Human computing. And then... All right. I'll show this. There's the, there's the actual folder. So if you look at this guy here, we there's a public documents folder on your machine. And by default, that's where your thumbnails are going to get stored. Now, they get stored in subfolders by whatever size you were using. So you guys might have noticed that you can choose what size all these you know thumbnails are. So like here, my grid, I've got them set to 48. But unless I wanted to go crazy, I really like seeing detail. I'm going to make them be, I don't know, 128, right? So now I've got these really giant thumbnails. I can't see many of them, but they're really giant, right? Um, and I could also say, hey, I barely like thumbnails at all. I just want to look at color, you know, just to see, you know, what I'm doing. And so I could, I could make them really, really small. I could, I could say, don't show me thumbnails at all. Or I could say, you only show them to me at 24 pixels tall, at which point they become very, very small. Um, whatever I chose for all the different sizes of thumbnails is going to get reflected in this folder over here. So, for instance, I just made some 24 ones, and now there's a 24 D, D, C, D... Dark Knight Returns the Golden Child thing, and it contains nothing but the thumbnails for this guy right here. Um, so that's what it does, and it does this just, you know, so if I go to a, go to a next title, next title, next title, you know, as fast as I can do that, it's, it's making all new thumbnails, and we go back out to the thumbnail directory for 24, you'll see that under D, because I chose a bunch of DC titles, now suddenly I've got a bunch of different DC folders and each of them have their own thumbnails inside them, right? Um, it will happily do this as much as it needs to as you go. And, and by the way, it also means that if you want to, you can just blow away your thumbnails folder and it'll just reconstitute them. Um, it's occasionally useful if it turns out that we ever gave a wrong picture for something, it stored the thumbnail and we gave you a right picture and somehow it didn't know to update your thumbnail. Uh, part of what it does when it downloads pictures is it tries to update all your existing thumbnails. But, uh, but if somehow that never happens, you can go ahead and just blow away your thumbnails folder and they'll just come back. Um, but is there a way to pre-compute all the sizes or even a size times all the pictures? Uh, no, there is not. Um, but And I'm not sure there should be because right now there's over 750,000 pictures in the database. Do you really want to make 750,000 thumbnails times as many sizes as you're, as you're ever going to want to see them in? I mean, that's a lot of files on your disk. Uh, and it, that, that, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that, I don't know if that one's worth it. But, you know, it's a good question. Um, all right, I think that, all right, am I, are we caught, caught up on questions on the chat? We are. And I think we've just about, um, I think we've just about gone and, and uh, worked out time for the day. Um, uh, and uh, Lance asks, uh, would it be possible to add a reload button to blow away and regenerate the thumbnails for the title being viewed? Um, maybe, I mean, I'm not sure if it should be a button, because a button's pretty heavy in terms of uh, just it, the interface footprint. Um, you know, should there be, I don't know, a menu item that does this, possibly? Um, or, I don't know. Um, or, I, I would just say, look, if, if you're finding yourself with drama over thumbnails, I would just go to your pictures folder. Uh, that's listed under manage pictures and movies and then your, lo your location. Uh, go to your thumbnails and just say blow them away. Uh, one thing that maybe makes some kind of sense, uh, I would say, um, and this is just my initial take. I mean, I, I always have like an initial take on these things. I always rethink them about 80 different times, you know, and then, so I mean, don't, 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 don't think that my initial take is set in stone at all. Uh, but uh, um, so we've got under here, under manage pictures and movies, so you go to file, manage pictures and movies we've got our location for pictures and movies you know maybe should we have a button over here which says delete all thumbnails or reset all thumbnails maybe um the one thing i'd warn you about that is it would take a really long time to do programmatically um windows um 
uh, Windows uh, Explorer gets to cheat in ways that programs don't. Uh, so for instance, if you just take that thumbnails directory, uh, so let's go out to it right now, uh, folder, let's go to my thumbnails, let's go back up here, eh, let's just cycle up, geez Louise, <laughs> this is not the most, this is not the easiest way to get here, uh, ah, come on, up, DC drive, oh, it's, it's the wrong place, anyway, alright, so let's just, let me just go there and see. Users. Public. Documents. All right. And here's, all right, so here's where all my stuff is, right? Here's where your pictures are. The thumbnails are going to be right next to it. I could go in here, and let's say I want to blow away all my 24 thumbnails. I literally could just move them out. I could just highlight it, hit delete, you know, and they're gone, right? Or for that matter, I could take all my thumbnails. Uh, and just you know, blow away the thumbnails folders, highlight, hit delete, and it's gonna it's gonna nuke them in a, a couple of seconds. Um, now it won't really nuke them. What it really does is move them to the trash. But it did it that fast for I don't know 50, 60 thousand thumbnails. Uh, the problem is if you do it programmatically, the interfaces you've got to work with as a programmer to delete or move 50, 60 thousand files are so much slower. It's you'd be talking like 10, 20 minutes to do the same job. Um, and so I would, you know, it's, it's hokey. I mean, it's, it, it kind of relies again on special knowledge, which isn't great. But, um, if, if I would say if your thumbnails are giving you woe, uh, it's just so much faster to go into windows Explorer and hit delete or move them or whatever else than it is for us to try to do anything. Um, that, um, uh, that probably be how I, I would tell you to do it. If you, you know, like I always think of it like, well, if I were just telling a buddy how to do it, that would be how I would tell my buddy to do it. Um, if I have to give like just a nice easy interface within the program for doing it, I could do it, but I'd have to say, warning, this might take 20, 30 minutes, um, depending on how many thumbnails you've got and how many sub sizes. So I'm not sure if it's a big win as a program feature. So anyway, yeah, but I reserve the right to change my mind on it. Okay, right. So, um, let's see here. Uh, and uh, Agent Camp says, go have a beer. You have it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm having a darn beer. It's been a day, guys. I don't know. I hope you guys, I don't know. I hope your day's been going well. My, 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 mine actually has ended okay, but man, it's had some rocky starts and stops. Uh, anyway, guys, thanks for joining us on this one. We'll catch more on another time. I think I've actually got enough set aside for a part two on one of these. So uh, we'll, we'll do stuff later on this. So thanks for joining us. Uh, tell your friends and make sure you hit that like and subscribe. Have a good one. See you next time. Bye-bye.